We got that now. Now we can talk about system functions. There's going to be a little bit of cells and molecules here. I'm not going to get into pathways yet. We're going to smoothly transition. And smooth transitions are important to the nervous system uh, and to muscles as well. A lot more on that in the next lecture. But we don't want jerky movements, we don't want abrupt changes. So we're going to gently coast away from cells and molecules in the systems. We'll touch on axon transport again. Uh, that's fairly important for how our peripheral nervous system works because we're not making any proteins out here, at least as far as our nerves are concerned. We have to transport it there. And when things wear out, which they inevitably do, we have to take them back to the cell body and recycle them. So we're going to be moving stuff along axons, and sometimes there's considerable distances to traverse. Because of their great length, axons are also sites of injury, so we'll review that again. If you remember last semester, then you're good to go. And if you don't, we'll go through it again, that's all right. And in between there, we'll talk just a bit about the very basic structure of a peripheral nerve. Because it's not just a bundle of axons. It's mostly a bundle of axons, but there's a couple other things in there that matter. This is either a really bad sign or, or okay. Oh, okay. Could be a really bad sign. Could be, we'll see. Who knows? Okay, great. This is wonderful. You guys didn't want to be efficient today, did you? No. Okay. Good. Yeah, fine. There was this. All right, we'll try that one more time. What's 
thank God I had a wonderful transition. Man, things were just flowing. Uh, this would be one of those abrupt stops. <laughs> one of those abrupt changes that we don't like. We shouldn't be thinking neurofilaments. These are nice and all, but there's no polarity to the subunits that make them up. In other words, there's no directionality to them. This way and that way, they all look the same. Not true for microtubules and microfilaments. The proteins that make them up have a side in this. They have plus ends, minus ends, and that allows molecules that latch on them to know, am I moving toward the center of the cell or am I moving away from the center of the cell? Here we can see the center of the cell. Those yellow filaments coming out will be the microtubules. And notice they're all organized in a single microtubule organizing center. That's how things know where the center is. The nucleus is usually pretty close to this. So after we're freshly made proteins, if we want to move to the periphery, just move toward the plus end of the microtubule and that will get you there. Toward the edge of the cell, we can see our kind of purplish active filaments. These are going to be for more local trafficking. Once we get in the general ballpark by riding along the microtubule express, we'll hop off and get onto a microfilament to hit our final destination. Uh, transport in the dendrites is chaos, so we're not going to talk about that. We're going to talk about transport in the axon, though, because that's what we're extending from the spinal cord out into the periphery. The reason it's not so chaotic in the axon is because we actually have a nice organization of our microtubules. Plus end is out here, minus end is over here. So we can tell which way we're moving. That allows motor proteins, like kinesin, which moves toward the plus end, always, and dynein, which moves toward the minus end, always, to carry out anterograde and retrograde transport, respectively. So if you're a newly made protein, you want to get down to the synapse, hop on kinesin, because that's going to attach to microtubules and run toward the plus end. If you're an old protein, you've got a few miles on you, you're not functioning properly, hop on to dynein. That's going to run toward the minus end and bring you back to the cell body where you can <laughs> insert it into a lysosome and broken down. So we got two directions that we're moving, anterograde and retrograde. Your ultimate destination is going to be determined by, of course, myosin-dependent protein on microfilaments because those are what we find out there in the periphery. At synapses, these are the filaments that give the synapse its actual structure, the shape of the cell, going to be determined by microfilaments because they're very dynamic, as we'll see in the third part of this lecture. What is this? What part of the cell am I looking at here? Dendritic spines. Axon, dendrite, yeah, dendritic spines. All these yellow things coming off, those are those little protrusions that come off of dendrites. 
They're very dynamic synapses. The reason that they're yellow here is because they're filled up with actin. Here we can see a cartoon schematic showing us our postsynaptic density. It's dense because it's full of proteins. It's postsynaptic because it's postsynaptic. And immediately below that postsynaptic density, we have an actin network. This can rearrange, it can grow in size if we want to shrink in that synapse. Maybe it's meaningful. Maybe it's not meaningful and we want to shrink it away. We're always treadmilling our actin filaments. So if we don't put energy into maintaining this, it will retract itself. Actin is very dynamic. Microtubules are far more stable. This is going to be important whenever we're looking at axon regrowth. But that long distance transport is all about microtubules. Microfilaments are more about dynamic structures. The microtubules are going to stay there for you all day so that we can run along them in the positive direction for anterograde transport. And this moves at different paces. On the bottom here, uh, we can actually see anterograde. There's fast anterograde. You see that one zip by? There goes another one. Look at these little red blobs moving around. These are uh, neurotrophin receptors. One specific type called track A, which is going to bind nerve growth factor, which is exactly what it sounds like. We can see here that these receptors are moving away from the cell body, so that's anterograde, or back toward the cell body, it would be retrograde. And what you'll notice here is that some of them are moving very quickly, some not so much, and that's because the stability of that interaction with kinesin isn't constant. This is still chaos. We're still talking about molecular function, so it still comes down to chance. Do you bump into kinesin in the adapter proteins that'll hold you there? Do you happen to fall off? How frequently do you fall off? That's what's going to determine your rate. Some things tend not to fall off very often. Snapping vesicles, neurotransmitter precursors, mitochondria, things that we need to get down to replenish our synapses. Hell, a fresh batch of lipids. You're going to need those every once in a while. Sometimes we cut those up. We need to get fresh ones down there. Proteins that we embed in the presynaptic membrane. Snares, for example. We have to replenish those when those wear out. We want to get those there quickly. So those interact stably with kinesin, and thus the, the chaos, that random diffusion, now has direction to it. Because they stick on kinesin, and kinesin runs toward the plus n. Others don't interact quite as stably, and they move more slowly. You can break this slow transport down into the slow component A and B if you want to say that the cytoskeletal components uh, will we'll get there a little bit slower than our soluble proteins. That's fine too. Or you can just say fast and slow, and you can notice that these are fairly different from each other. We might be moving up to I don't know, half a meter if you're lucky in a day. That's pretty good compared to maybe half a millimeter in a day. So orders of magnitude different here between fast and slow. And that's all because different proteins interact with different stability. This is a more modern day approach to seeing this. And you can see both retrograde and anterograde transport. Here's how we originally figured all this out. This is a pulse chase experiment where you put on some radioactive amino acids do a few hours, these will get incorporated into newly made proteins and shuttle down the axon. And those that move quickly are going to get there sooner. And those that are slower will get there later. And you can just watch the movement of radioactivity down the axon. So they only deliver a single pulse of radioactivity, so they know for 15 minutes we gave the radioactive amino acids, then they were washed away. So any of this radiation that ends up down the axon, which we can measure across time, must have come originally from the cell body, so they could see actually two or three distinct pools moving along the axon. And the reason for that is because of different interaction with this motor protein here. Kinesin is always running down the microtubules. The question is, does it have any cargo? With these cargo, it's very likely. And that's why they're transported rapidly. Less likely down here, but we'll still get net diffusion in the plus n direction. Retrograde is just going to be from a different motor protein. 
dynein runs toward the minus end, therefore it's going to move toward the cell body. There's two things that, that we're doing with retrograde transport. One is removing old cell components, like proteins or organelles. Because we still have mitochondria down there in the presynaptic site. We're still going to generate free radicals. Those are still going to donate electrons and break apart macromolecules. And when that happens, we need to get rid of them. A protein that's not functioning properly is of no use. So we'll hop on dynein and move back to the cell body. We'll put these damaged components into lysosomes, break them apart, and recycle the building blocks of them. The other thing that we do is provide some sort of feedback to the nucleus about how active this neuron is. How often are we communicating with our post synaptic target, for example? Have you ever heard use it or lose it? Yeah. Well, it's true. When a neuron communicates with a muscle, that muscle provides a little feedback. That feedback comes in the form of nerve growth factor, for example. So neurotrophins that bind to those track receptors that we just saw zipping on the last slide. Well, when those are stimulated, they head back to the nucleus and stimulate the expression of pro-survival genes. They keep the neuron from killing itself. Because that is the, the logic of the nervous system. Make an excess of neurons. Those that find their target will get neurotrophins and they won't kill themselves. Those that don't find their target and innervate a muscle, they should kill themselves. They're not doing anything for us and they're just wasting our ATP. They're wasting our glucose and our oxygen. Get rid of them. Only those neurons that we're actually using should survive. And that's why we use it or lose it. So if you're not innervating the muscle, if you're not receiving that positive feedback, well now we're going to send a different type of receptor back that's going to activate pro-death pathways and cause the neuron to be eliminated. So that retrograde signaling is very important for kind of fine-tuning our nervous system after development. We have this excess and we need to get rid of it. The way that we do that is just keep the ones that actually innervate a muscle alive. How do we know if they innervate a muscle? There's only one way. We have to have feedback from that muscle. And we gotta take it all the way from the periphery back to the central nervous system. That's of course accomplished by dynein. Now the rate here is somewhere in between the very fast and the slow component of anterograde transport, as you can see. And we want this to be fairly quick. There's an important task here. Keep the cell alive. Life and death decisions are made based on retrograde transport. That's not enough to get you excited. I don't know what it is. Maybe some toxins? This is the bad side of that. Sometimes toxins can latch onto those receptors that are gonna hop onto dynein and move back to the cell body. This is how we can get some viral infections like rabies. We have tetanus toxin infection as a result. That can lead to paralysis because of uncontrolled muscle contractions. Maybe that gets you going, I don't know. But what's going on out there in the periphery, here's our presynaptic site. Here's a little receptor that we've activated because we talked to a muscle and the muscle said, here, take this and live. We take it into the cell. There's a few ways that we could endocytose it. If you want to talk about all those, we can. But either way, we pinch off a vesicle. There's a whole bunch of proteins involved here, which we're not going to talk about. The one we care about is this one, dynein. <coughs> dynein is the motor protein right here. We're going to attach via an adapter to this activated receptor. And we're going to run this whole complex back to the cell body so we can affect gene expression. And then our neurons live, and we live. Or we can show up to class and learn. I know. Uh, do you have any questions? I also accept feedback. Okay, well then let's review these and we'll move on. All right. Antrograde and retrograde transport, I believe, is the first one. Adam, which one do you want to tell me about? All right, we're going to go anterograde transport here. Uh, what color would you like to make that? Uh, green. 
Okay. I like that. All right. So, um, what's the function of anterograde transport? To carry proteins to the axon terminal towards the axon. Excellent. All right. How do we do that? With kinesin. Ah, uh, okay. There's our motor protein. There it is. We'll put a little key up here. Which way does that move on the microcuticles? For which end? Towards the terminal. Fantastic. Plus or minus? Plus. Fantastic. What about the speed? It can be fast or slow. Why? It depends how the uh, protein interacts with anything. So if it's stable, it'll move faster. Yeah, exactly. Kinesin is always moving. The question is, how much time are we spending on here? Do you keep hopping off the train and hopping back on? So our cargo exists kind of in equilibrium here with kinesin. It can be on, it can be off. Which way are we biasing toward? If we're biasing toward interacting with kinesin, if it's more stable, then it's going to be faster. And if you tend to fall off, you're just going to diffuse randomly until you happen to attach for a little bit in that direction. So it's a constant on-off. We're going to replenish synapses. Why do we have to do that? Because they can't make proteins on their own. Exactly. They're not making proteins. They might need some of those. Oh, maybe they need one of these things. What is this? Nice. All right. Bonus points. Alex. We have handled antrograde as far as I'm concerned. What's the other one? Retrograde. Jesus. What color would you like? Uh, is that purple or blue? This is blue. I was expecting green, but that's all right. What's the function? Uh, to move stuff, proteins, whatever, from the terminal back towards the cell. Okay, great. How do we do that? Uh, with dynein. Excellent. All right, there's dynein there. Which uh, end of the microtubules does dynein move toward? The negative. There you go. We're always minus n directed with, with dynein. Reminds me, we should probably. Uh, how about the speed here? Uh, it's rapid. Yeah. Uh, let's say recycle. Let's say refresh. So recycle, what do we mean by that? What are we doing when we're, when we're saying we're recycling cell components? What kind of stuff might we recycle? Okay, great. After what? Not, what about this fresh new one that we just deposited there? Look how shiny it is. <laughs> Do we want to get rid of that one yet? No. No, but what about this kind of beat up, damaged mitochondria? I'd say so. What if we didn't get rid of our damaged mitochondria? What might happen? Is that your cell death? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, last semester is still true. So we might want to get rid of this junk so it doesn't kill us. Sounds reasonable. And we'll do that in our recycling center, the lysosome. Refresh. What am I talking about there? Kate. What's up? Refresh. And, and I want to direct your attention toward this red thing that I drew. Maybe that'll help refresh your memory. What's that red thing over there? What do you think? You know, honestly, I'm not going to try to draw right that red thing. Okay. So the refresh, I'm assuming. Hold on, hold on. You just oh. wait now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you wait a minute. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, it's a muscle. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah, let's... Stripes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
what I did. Okay. okay. Huh. What does that have to do with refresh? Um, the other function of retrograde is to give back signaling to the nucleus of which receptors are firing and what's still being active versus what isn't. Okay, great. So let's say we communicate successfully with our muscle. Uh, what neurotransmitter am I dumping out here? Thank you. Acetylcholine. As we'll find out, this is going to cause the muscle to contract. I'm sure we already know that. We're going to provide a little bit of feedback. Neurotrophins. Uh, we'll just make that one red. And we'll bring that into the cell. And what does that do for us now that we've stimulated some neurotrophin receptor? Now it's active. Um, it connects with dynein and it goes back to the nucleus, so it knows that that one is um, active, so it can be used to replenish it. Okay. Excellent. And that's how we know which neuron should we keep. Which of these numerous excess neurons deserve space in our nervous system? They don't all deserve space. We have too many of them. A couple reasons. If we produce just enough, no more, no less than what we need, what if they don't find the right target? Well, now that muscle doesn't work. That little, the, the muscle fibers that should have been innervated, and now we can't, we can't contract those. We're gonna be a little weaker. That's no good. So instead we make an excess, because finding their target, I mean, that's pure chaos. It's going to be guided by some diffusible and non-diffusible guidance cues, but you know, in the end, when you're talking about molecular function, it's chance. So we just use a bunch of molecules, or in this case we use a bunch of cells. Not all of them make it. Just those that get that feedback. Okay, anything on that you want to review? No. All right, then we'll move ahead. Just a quick touch on uh, what we find in peripheral nerves. We're gonna be working our way back into the nervous system. And then we'll work our way up for the rest of the class. So that interface between spinal cord and skin or muscle or tendon, that's going to be through our peripheral nerves. It's the input, the output. So we're going to be talking about big bundles of axons here. Now when you're in the peripheral nerve, the mixture, you're going to have sensory and motor components. They're going to be all mixed together so that when you have peripheral nerve damage, you're going to have sensory and motor disturbances. There's a separation once we hit the central nervous system. More on that in lectures 9 and 10. But for the rest of the signaling pathways, motor and sensory remain separated as we move up the spinal cord into the thalamus and eventually to the cortex to produce some sort of perception. Or when we're going from the cortex down to the spinal cord to carry on movement, they're kept separate. In the nerves, they're mixed, and that mixing occurs as they exit the vertebra there. That's where our dorsal portion here, the sensory component, which contains afferents, so those that are arriving into the spinal cord. Information flow is this direction. That's where those sensory afferents are going to meet up with the motor E parents. They're exiting the spinal cord to cause some sort of effect. Whatever helps you remember the A and the E, use it. Some of those effects are going to be just muscle contractions, overt changes in body position. And then other functions could be smooth muscle contractions, changes in heart rate, things that the autonomic nervous system carries out. Once they come together here, now we're mixed. And we're going to have both sensory and motor components. 
before we exit completely, we send off a little offshoot to innervate meninges there, ligaments, intervertebral discs. So we're innervating the, the spine itself here so that whenever we have damage, movement of discs, inflammation, we can pick that up. We can detect that damage and we can feel back pain as a result. So this meningeal branch is a big source of back pain. Anytime you have spinal abnormalities, meningeal branches get stimulated and they create the perception of back pain. You often don't see these, you don't see them here in this cartoon, uh, but they're fairly important uh, because back pain can shut you down. Once we exit the spinal cord, whenever we're in regions that contain the autonomic efferents, uh, we have to meet up with a postganglionic neuron. Uh, for the sympathetic nervous system, that's going to be in your thoracic and upper lumbar regions of the spine. For parasympathetic, it'll just be down there in the sacral <coughs> portions. But you won't have these uh, sympathetic chain ganglia there. It'll just be some ganglia near the, the target organ. That preganglionic axon that exits, so our, our vertebra is here, here's that intervertebral foramen, so we've exited and now we're outside the spine itself. Here's this chain of postganglionic neurons that runs alongside the spine on both sides. That myelinated fiber comes around through the white communicating ramus and then heads back as an unmyelinated fiber from the postganglionic neuron. So your autonomic signals are going to be a little bit slower because of that lack of myelin. Just keep that in mind. That's okay because what they're innervating acts slowly anyway. So you're, you're not producing some rapid response to environmental stimulus like you are with just somatic Defense. There we want immediate movements because we might need to get out of the way of danger. Slowly adjusting so that you're ready to have a meal and digest, we can take our time with that. So there might be this little loop here so we can communicate with a postganglionic sympathetic target and that's only for the autonomic nervous system here that we have this. For those postganglionic fibers and everything else that exits, we're then going to divide and split into a smaller dorsal component, so the dorsal rami, and then the larger ventral component. The dorsal component is really just going to innervate the back. It'll hit the muscles, skin. It'll hit the internal organs as well. The ventral component is much larger because it's going to hit a greater number of targets. It's going to hit the limbs, neck, front of the trunk. But these ventral uh, branches are going to be much larger just because they have a, a larger territory to innervate. Whether you're in a dorsal or, or ventral component, it doesn't matter. The peripheral nerves are all going to look pretty much the same. They're going to basically be bundles of axons with a few extra components. This should look very familiar here. Now, of course, we want to protect those axons. They're not encased in any bony structures, and so they're liable to be damage from time to time. You're going to bump into things. So we want to provide some cushion. We have a few layers of protection. The outer component would be the tough epineurium. This is the dura mater, just extended out onto the peripheral nerve. Same thing though. Surrounding these bundles of axons, we have the continuation of the arachnoid and pia mater, called the perineurium. This is going to prevent any diffusion of toxic components in those blood vessels, the large blood vessels found throughout peripheral nerves from diffusing in and damaging axons. So this uh, separates the, the nerves themselves from that connective tissue around there. So this acts as a diffusion barrier to keep these axons isolated from the blood. Blood is toxic to neurons, so we want to have a few diffusion barriers built in. This is kind of like the blood-brain barrier except it's out in the nerve. Within these bundles, we have sort of a, kind of like 
gelatin in a way. It's collagen, so it's just a very tight gelatin. But a bunch of collagen fibers that create this, essentially this gelatinous matrix called endonerium. So it's a cushion that all of these axons, it's all these little circles here, and the glia found within them, they're going to float around in this gel. Again, to provide a cushion to make sure that there's no extreme pressure placed on our nerves. Because that pressure is going to first kill the glia, then kill the axon. Sometimes that happens, we'll get to that in a bit. So here's another cross section. We can see the larger blood vessels here. Outside are bundles of axons, those fascicles that are surrounded by perineurium. The glia in there are going to be Schwann cells. They're always Schwann cells, but not every Schwann cell is a myelinating Schwann cell. Of course, when you learn about oligodendrocytes and Schwann cells, you learn that they make myelin, and that's totally true, except when it's not. There are non-myelinating versions of both. And those non-myelinating versions of both are analogous to astrocytes in terms of their function. They're going to buffer, in this case, potassium. Because we're not forming synapses within the nerve itself. All we're doing is conducting action potentials. We don't need to pick up any neurotransmitter here. We're not releasing it. But we are releasing potassium. What would happen if we didn't buffer that potassium? Let's say extracellular potassium levels rise. Then what? Andy. Happy birthday. <laughs> and what would happen if we didn't buffer that potassium? <clears throat> what if we didn't clean it up? So we conduct an action potential down the axon. Sodium rushes in, potassium rushes out. If we don't soak up that potassium, what happens to extracellular potassium levels? You get way too high. There you go. What happens to the reversal of potassium? Kind of brain dumb talking about that test, to be honest. Well, I see. <laughs> I see. So we have less of a diffusive force. Do we need a strong of an electrical force to offset that? No. So we're not going to be as negative. We're going to depolarize. What are we most permeable to at rest? Oh, there you go. So the cell is going to depolarize. We don't want that. We want to make sure that we keep extracellular potassium levels low so that the action potentials are only generated in response to some sort of input, either from the periphery if it's sensory or from the central nervous system if it's a motor axon. We need to keep potassium low so that our activity occurs during appropriate times. When this doesn't happen, the smallest fibers are the ones that are going to get activated, and those are the ones that conduct pain. You don't want this to happen. I believe we'll talk about this um, when we discuss the trigeminal nerve. But this happens on occasion. When these non-myelinating Schwann cells are damaged and they don't suck up potassium, the action potential can actually jump from one axon to another. And the axons that get excited by that extra of potassium are the ones with the highest input resistance because B equals IR. That's still true, by the way. So the small pain-sensing axons will get stimulated and you will feel pain, even though there's nothing actually damaging your tissue. So myelin's great, but so is potassium buffering. These Schwann cells are also going to do a little bit more than myelinate. They're going to provide uh, the, they're going to be the middleman between blood and axon. They're going to shuttle glucose, for example, into neurons so that they can pay the bill. They can keep their sodium potassium pump going. So we maintain that diffusive force for all of our ions. So we maintain proper resting membrane potential. And just like astrocytes, these form a big network. They have gap junctions that hold them all together. Now I know it looks like this non-myelinating Schwann cell here is myelinating these little axons, but it's not true. It's just simply surrounding them, but it's not removing ion channels from the axon itself. It's just sitting very close so that whenever the action potential occurs, 
we can soak up that extracellular potassium. But non-myelinating non Schwann cells are still important. They're also going to play a role in injury recovery, but that is a topic for the next part of this talk. Before we go into that, do we have any questions? All righty, then let's work through these. We'll move on to the last part. It's, let's see, what are we talking about? Okay, um, horns. All right, what are the horns on here? Uh, so the horns are in the spinal cord, the kind of darker portion in there. Yeah, gray matter or white matter? They are gray matter. Fantastic. All right, tell me about the dorsal and ventral. How are so they different? The dorsal will be sensory, so that's carrying Sensory air flow up to the brain. Right. And then the ventral is motor, so it's carrying motor down to whatever it's going to. Nice. Nice. We find our lower motor neurons right down here. In between those, we're going to have inner neurons that help uh, refine reflexes, things like that. And in the dorsal portion, we're going to have neurons that are very much involved with sensation. Where do we find the primary somatosensory afferents, though? Primary somatosensory. you're totally right. Sensory, motor. That's a great way of thinking about the spinal cord. Dorsal should be sensory, ventral motor. But where do we house those primary somatosensory neurons, those pseudo unipolar neurons? Is that in the dorsal nerve root? Dorsal root ganglion, yeah, right here. So it's in the dorsal root and it's a collection of cell bodies, so we call it a ganglion. Yeah, that's where their cell bodies live. Now, some of them are going to form a synapse here. Those that are involved in uh, pain sensation, thermal sensation, those will definitely do that. Those involved with tactile sensation will just send their axon on over and zip up the spinal cord. They'll also form synapses there, too. So the nerve roots, where are those on here? Those are. Those are. So we know what we're talking about. So these, are these guys coming right off of the. Oh, they look like roots. <laughs> yeah, all right, so that makes sense. And then what's that hole between the vertebra? Where do we find that? Or the intervertebral foramen? The, the foramen is right here. Excellent. So going between the vertebra, there's going to be one kind of on top of that, too. Nice. So it's a hole. We're going to send that peripheral nerve out through it. And then we're going to split. Which one's the dorsal ramus? So we'll have the dorsal ramus here. Or, yeah, dorsal ramus here. Oh, there we so go. Think, and then uh -huh. ramus back. Yeah, yeah, so you know dorsal up here. Now, how can we also tell dorsal? Let's say I got rid of that spinal cord. Which one's going to be bigger, dorsal or ventral? Ventral. Why? Yeah. Exactly, we got to hit more stuff. A lot of our body is limb. <laughs> so that means the ventral part has to be bigger. If there's an additional number of targets to hit, you have to have an additional number of axons, and those take up space. Just remember it that way. But usually this will be within sight, so you can see those kind of wider anterior or ventral horns, those are going to be motor, and that'll help guide you as well. Also, if you see the vertical body, that helps. Uh, okay, thank you. Wonderful. Now let's make sure we can tell when we're separated and when we are mixed. Um, we'll be separated until you hit the nerve, like where they come together. These, um, like right here? Yeah. And then when they go out into uh, the ram, either both. <clears throat> okay, great. So everything, once we exit our spine, it's all mixed. All right, here's a cross-section of a nerve. There's a little bit of damage from where they were preparing their specimen. Don't worry about those little cracks. It happens. Lauren. Yeah. There you are. Where's the epineurium? Sounds like a whole Exactly. The dura, essentially. What about perineurium? Very good. It surrounds the fascicles, like this. Are all fascicles the same size? Maybe not. Um, 
a little tidbit too. Axons are going to jump from basketball to basketball. They'll cross over here. It's chaos. <laughs> what about the endonarium? What is that? Uh, there we go. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever had jello with like, uh, you know, stuff in it? That's what this is. Make some uh, jello and put spaghetti in it, and you eventually <laughs> made uh, a little spastical. <laughs> it's a nice Halloween treat. Do they make tomato <laughs> jello? <laughs> 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 Use tomato. Um, any questions <laughs> on, on this? We got a mixture of connective tissue that's going to help protect our, our nerves. Hopefully, we get that. Physical protection, protection against toxins, a little spongy protection again. Normally, those work pretty well. You can live your life and often not have significant nerve damage. But on occasion, nerves get damaged. Um, it could be a, a nerve, it could be a tract in the central nervous system, that's far worse because the peripheral and central nervous systems are going to recover differently. This is still true. Axons are, of course, the primary site of injury. She Googled it. Tomato jello? Tomato jello. So, those noodles are very long. Therefore, they occupy a larger space than other components of the neuron, and therefore, it's just more likely that axons are going to be injured than other parts of the neuron. They're spread out over a larger area. So by chance, you'd expect axons to be injured. This is true whether we're talking central or peripheral damage. It's especially true in the periphery because it's just a bunch of axons. But even in the central nervous system, Axon loss occurs whenever we have nervous system injury. They are very easy to break because they're long and thin. And here we can see the loss of axons, sort of. We're actually just comparing two different people. This is not a before and after. And different folks have different numbers of axons, but bear with me. Um, all of these different colors are just telling you kind of the direction that water tends to diffuse. Water has directional diffusion when there are barriers to its ability to diffuse. It should, like everything else, just spread out in all directions. It should be random. It's not, though, whenever that water is moving within a bundle of axons because of the myelin. It's a bunch of fat, and fat and water don't mix. So when the water is surrounded by bundles of axons all moving in one direction, well, the water can really only move in that direction. And we can pick that up with MRI and trace our axons. That's what we're looking at here and here. And you'll notice there are some significant gaps in those axon tracks. Normally we should have our axons radiating out from all of the corpus callosum here. So this is the bundle of axons that's connecting both sides of our cerebral hemispheres. And we should be connecting all of the cerebral hemispheres, essentially. We bias more toward the frontal lobes, but we're still going to hit all of the lobes. Notice it's nice and fairly uniform over here. Now we've had some injury, and so axons are lost. When this occurs, when axons are damaged, there's going to be degeneration away from the cell body because this can't make any new proteins. It can't do anything. It has a limited supply of what's there. It can't make any new proteins. It can't respond to that injury because it doesn't have a nucleus. It can't actually change gene expression. It's totally dependent on the cell body in order to replenish the proteins that are there. Now it's been cut off. When that happens, this is going to wither. It's going to wither because the, the glia there are going to destroy it. It's going to also destroy itself. We're going to cut it up into little bits, and we'll eat that and recycle it. Everything is fine. But this neuron here is going to have to regrow and retrace that lost axon. You might see a little bit of retrograde degeneration, but for the most part, what you find is anterograde degeneration. So away from the cell body. 
And that should make new, that should make good sense. Only the part that can make proteins will survive. Now out there in the periphery, axons can regenerate fairly well, and that's because of the Schwann cells that are there. They're going to play a few key roles in allowing axons to regenerate. One of the things that they'll do is clean up the mess. They'll spit out proteases. Proteases are just enzymes that cut up proteins. So they're going to start to break apart that cell debris that's there and make it a little more digestible to the macrophages that they recruit. We're not in the central nervous system anymore. We have access to the immune system. So we can recruit them. Schwann cells are going to help do that. So they'll clean up the mess themselves to some degree, but they'll also bring in the pros, the macrophages that are designed to engulf and recycle damaged tissue. So here we're seeing a little crush injury on an axon, so when you squeeze it, that's going to cause it to pop and die. We have our anthrograde degeneration, part of that's driven by the Schwann cell here, and it's also going to be by recruiting immune cells that are going to eat up all of those little bits of axon and clear the way. So they remove the debris, that's your anthrograde degeneration. We're getting rid of the rest of that axon but not the proximal portion. Because we're going to try to guide this to its target. Schwann cells are going to help do this. What they'll do is secrete guidance cues and neurotrophic factors that are going to keep that axon alive and stimulate growth of the cytoskeleton. That's what guidance cues do. There's really two things that they can do. The first is allow the cytoskeleton to grow. The other thing that they can do is allow the cell to stick. And both of those really need to happen. We'll see more in just a bit on that. And Schwann cells will do both. They'll keep the cell alive, tell it to create a greater amount of protein it's going to need to because it has to actually grow. It's going to allow that growth by stabilizing those cytoskeletal filaments so they elongate. Now we're biasing the cytoskeleton toward growth rather than an equal amount of growth and retraction. Cells don't grow because they're destroying their cytoskeleton at the same rate that they're building it. But they don't sit there and do nothing. They're always just treadmilling their cytoskeletal filaments. They're pulling in and growing more out. It might look like nothing. There's just no net movement, kind of like a reversal potential. Ions still move. When cells aren't growing, their cytoskeleton is still moving. There's just no net movement. We want net movement. So we stabilize those filaments so they don't fall apart. And then we give the axon something to hold on to. If it can't actually put its foot down and take a step, it's just going to be flopping and it won't stick. Why does an axon end up in one place versus another? It gets in where it fits in, wherever it can bind sticks. And if it can't bind over here, it won't go there. It's just that simple. We'll see it in just a moment. Once this is all said and done, and we've regrown, we followed along in our Schwann cell here. Here's that growing portion of the axon. It's called the growth cone. It's kind of cone-shaped, uh, not really, and it grows. So that part is pretty good. That's going to grow along to retrace the original path of that axon. If it was myelinated, we'll remyelinate it. If it wasn't, we won't. When we keep our connective tissue intact, such as in a, a mild crush injury, for example, rather than a laceration that actually severs the nerve, regrowth is a lot more probable because we have this nice little road here. We haven't severed our, our fascicle bundle. We still have the road. We still have that... that path of Schwann cells that we can step on one step at a time to reach our target. So here's a growth cone. Here's what's actually going on whenever neurons are growing. There's two components here that we can see. And we'll, we'll get it moving. And we'll get it moving now. The green component is actin. You're going to notice this is very dynamic. It's going to be out toward the periphery. The red is tubulin, microtubules, 
was going to be a little more toward the center and they're a little more stable. What they did there was apply one of those guidance cues. Notice how we get these long extensions. We've stabilized the cytoskeleton and allowed it to grow, and it's growing toward that. We're biasing cytoskeletal growth toward this guidance cue. That's what Schwann cells are doing. They're allowing that growth cone to extend cytoskeletal filaments so that it moves down toward its target. The other thing that the Schwann cell is going to do is give it something to stick to because that actin is always getting pulled back. I want you to notice these green filaments. They grow out here and then they get pulled back in. That's always happening. Actin is very dynamic. We're always building it and pulling it back. It's called actin treadmilling. It's like a treadmill. It goes nowhere if the rate of growth and pull is the same. It also goes nowhere if when you pull on it, it's not stuck to anything. This is the other function of Schwann cells. When you send out that philopodia, that little finger-like projection of axon, if you have nothing to grab onto and you pull on it, the cell doesn't move. That's what we can see up there. No movement. We didn't stick. We didn't have a Schwann cell there to guide us. On the other hand, if that actin filament and the surface cell adhesion molecule that it's attached to can stick, for example, if that's a Schwann cell down there. Then whenever we pull on the actin, rather than pulling the philopodia back, we pull the whole cell forward. We pull our growth cone in the direction that we want to move. So now, here's our new set point. We grow out another philopodia. Do we stick? If we stick here, we'll go that way. If we don't, then we'll just pull that philopodia back and we'll send another one out. Do I stick here? Great, I'll go this way. The only way that the growth cone knows where to go is places where it can actually extend its cytoskeleton because it's being stabilized through the release of guidance cues and places that it sticks to because when it, if it doesn't stick it just pulls back that philopodium and this allows the axon to slowly crawl its way to its target and it works fairly well in the periphery this is not the case in the central nervous system we have a different set of glia there Oligodendrocytes and Schwann cells make different myelin. The, the myelin that Schwann cells make is a little fluffier. Hopefully we remember that. A little more cushion there for whenever you get to cushion on things. You keep your axons intact. Not so in the central nervous system. We have a skull. That's going to protect us and it also sets the amount of space that we have available for our nervous system. So we need to conserve space. We can't make this big fluffy myelin. We need to make it a little more compact. So we're going to have different proteins that allow that to happen. The different proteins that we find in myelin from oligodendrocytes, from Schwann cells, also affects how axons can grow along that myelin. One of these proteins is no-go. Axons won't grow on it, hence the name. The receptors that no go binds to are going to destabilize actin. So you can't grow out your little finger like projections. Here's a nice growth cone. Here's a growth cone. Everywhere a growth cone. But down here, notice there's no growth cone. We're not forming this, this collection of little actin filaments that we're sending out because we squirted no-go on it. And we're stimulating no-go receptors and we're destabilizing those philopodia. So we can't try to crawl around in our environment in part because of destabilized actin filaments in the growth cone. Oligodendrocytes don't want axons to regrow. We don't want to rearrange our central nervous system once we put it all together and we learn stuff and we put important information in here. Well, we want to make this fairly stable. We'll allow for little subtle changes, but we don't want to dramatically rewire our central nervous system. So oligodendrocytes keep that unlocked by having surface proteins that destabilize the growth cone. No major regrowth of axons. You can see it here, and you can see it in uh, this experiment we saw last semester. It's as old as I am. 
and it's still true today. They put a bunch of uh, embryonic nerve cells here in the center of a dish and then pass the optic nerve and the sciatic nerve out different ends. Central with all of the dendrocytes, peripheral with swan cells. What do you think happened? Well, whenever we look, here's the edge of our sciatic nerve. So if we're looking, hold on, we're looking right here in the dish to see whether or not axons came out. They did. Here they are. Here's a bunch of axons that exited from that sciatic nerve. The optic nerve, on the other hand, there's nothing out here. Just dish. That's it. Nothing grew through that optic nerve because it was filled with oligodendrocytes. With their myelin, that has things like no-go on it. So you couldn't stabilize your actin cytoskeleton. You get no net growth. There's only treadmill. And we don't have stuff to stick to like we do on Schwann cells. Peripheral nervous system, things grow pretty well. Central, not so much. The other thing that happens in the central nervous system is the formation of glial scars. This top panel is just showing you nuclei, and they're highlighting the area of crush injury on the right versus the left. So right and left are the same, except they put a little outline here that you don't need. You can see it right here. GFAP is an intermediate filament found in astrocytes, so the red signal right here in part B is just showing you astrocytes. And you'll notice that they line up right around that area of injury and form a glial scar. They will also affect growth cones. Astrocytes also make surface proteins. And what they do is essentially get the axons addicted to the glial scar so they don't want to leave. They create proteins that interact stably with the growth cone so that it's never able to exit that glial scar. So when we have a crush injury in our spinal cord here, axons that are growing down are gonna encounter that glial scar and then never wanna leave. Not only do we have oligodendrocytes preventing axon growth, but glial scars also don't help. And this is one area of active interest in terms of spinal cord injury recovery. How do we break up that, that essentially that, that sticky glial scar that's holding our axons hostage? Any questions? Are we all visualizing actin now? It's always moving back and forth. It's very dynamic, like I said at the beginning. And you can actually see that in real time if you click back a couple of slides. All righty, well, let's go through these and we'll call it a class. Why are actons the usual site of injury? There's one of uh, they are longer than in any sort of compression for a long period of time. Um, stops the nutrients from getting back to the cell to promote survivability. So the compressed oxon is set and then nothing can get to whatever target it's supposed to be. Okay, great. We're not going to get to our target, so that's getting us into the next question as well. I do want you to think about the size of the axon versus the rest of the neuron. Neurons are mostly axon when you, when you think about the actual space that they occupy. So let's say we do injure this axon. So you're telling me that we're not going to communicate with our target. Now simplify this if we're just thinking about one here. So are we spitting out neurotransmitter anymore? What's the logic of the nervous system whenever we're developing? We make an excess of neurons or just enough? Yeah. Excess, yeah. How do we know which ones are excess and disposable? They have retrograde transport, which brings the neurotrophic factors back to the neuron. Great. So if I'm central or peripheral, it doesn't matter. It's the same thing. There's an excess. And we see waves of neurodegeneration occur throughout development. So when I sever this axon and I'm not spitting out neurotransmitter anymore, What happens to the retrograde 
neurotrophic release. It's not getting back to it. Exactly, that feedback to say stay alive, neurotrophic factor release. Well, that doesn't occur. How do you think that makes this neuron feel? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> It makes it feel like it's just excess, like it's disposable. So the response is apoptosis. We're going to get anterograde degeneration. So all of this is going to fall apart. We're not going to retrace our steps in the central nervous system, that is. So we won't hit our target again. We won't get that neurotrophic feedback. Done. Luckily, we have an excess of neurons and we can stand to lose a lot of them. So we'll actually eventually get retrograde degeneration as well. Because we don't regrow. Not so in the peripheral nervous system. Because we have Schwann cells around and they do a number of wonderful things for us. Brianna. Let's talk about Schwann cells and what they're going to do for us. So Schwann cells um, do a couple different things for us. They can help like clean up. So by um, recruiting like macrophages with the secretion of proteases, um, Schwann cells can also help guide like axonal growth. Um, and they do that by secreting neurotrophic factors and then local guidance cues that help. Okay, you're flying, I'm trying to keep up here. <laughs> so we'll release proteases that are going to cut up that severed axon. We're going to recruit macrophages, you said. What are those going to do for us? They're going to do what they do clean up all that section. Okay, it's red because it's from blood, even though it's not red. Bear with me. And okay, you know what? Pac-Man. I think of Pac-Man here. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to release stuff that's going to either cut up the axon, that'd be proteases, or stuff that's going to recruit. Can I spell this right? Mm -hmm. Recruit? That looks really weird to me. You ever had that? Yes. Or a word looks strange. Um, and they'll, they'll eat that. So they're going to promote degeneration. And then you said they're going to spit out uh, guidance cues? Is that right? Um, yes. And something like that? Yes. What do those do? So those help to like stabilize our cytoskeleton. Okay, great. They're going to guide the axon. And what they're going to do is uh, promote action growth. So our growth cone is going to be able to extend out those little podia. And they're ugly in real life. Okay, so we, we send a finger out for it. Have I done something inappropriate with the public laughter? We send out these philopodia, then what? Um, what else do Schwann cells do? They, um, well, they secrete the neurotrophic factors, which promote growth. Oh, okay. So we need to make more protein, so okay, yes. back here. So neurotrophic factor, and that's going to lead to protein synthesis. So we can grow. Just overt growth of the cell is going to have to happen, and that requires making more proteins. Okay. So then we, we, we send out our, our fingers. Now what? Um, so Schwann cells also like, help provide that like, stepping stone. Excellent. To grab onto. Excellent. So it's going to have cell adhesion molecules exactly what they sound like. 
because it allows these are molecules that help cells stick together. So whenever we pull on that filopodia, which we're always doing, the growth cone gets pulled forward. Because this is a back and forth. I know I drew the arrow that way, but we're always going back. We're putting out a finger here, a finger there. Which direction do I want to go? I don't know, where can I stick? That's where I'll go. Oh, I'm going to go along the Schwann cell. And I'm going to follow all those Schwann cells down to my target. What is this? Thank you. Now all I have to do is draw red lines and you know. That's how we learn, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Um, anything else? Anything you'd like to go over? Yes? Cut up axon. Okay. <laughs> Great question. Okay, well, if that's it, I got nothing else for you. Get out there and be somebody.